Well, I am excited about this word today. And I, I feel like you're ready and you're ready and want to lean in. How many of you know uh, that God likes to show up in unexpected places? I'm going to talk at, at length about that this morning, but it also is a matter of your expectation. And expectation really matters a lot. If you, if you lean in today and, and, and reach and say, God, I want to hear what you have to say, God's word is powerful. We take the word of God real seriously around here. We believe that God's word is, is life and it, and it creates and it breaks chains and it, it's powerful. And, and I heard a funny story last night actually about uh, some ladies at our church who understand just how powerful the word of God is. Um, a few weeks ago, you might have been here, I, I spoke some declarations over our church, just some things that I felt the Lord put on my heart, uh, and I spoke some declarations, just kind of coming in agreement with the Word of God. And I was speaking declarations, and I, I told, some friends of mine told us, told me that they were sitting behind a couple ladies who uh, were, were receiving the declarations, just, yes, Lord, we receive that in Jesus' name, amen, one after another. And then I got to the one about God opening up barren wombs. And uh, these ladies were well past uh, child rearing years and, and one lady clued into just how powerful the word of God is and, and they told me that they saw her go like this and pull her hand down. <laughs> and, and, then she, and then she reached over to her friend that was beside her and pulled her hand down too because <laughs> God's word's powerful and uh, it's not messing around and, she, and, they, and they knew that. So I hope today that you understand that, that God's word can do things. And if you receive it, uh, God will, will speak life and, and, and break chains. And just amazing things happen when you lean in and receive. That's why I'm always after you to let me know you're getting this. Say amen. Shout me down. Let me know that you're, you're receiving this because your expectation is where God's going to meet you today. But God also shows up in unexpected ways. And I want to talk about that today. We have been journeying through the book of Genesis. If you're just joining us, it's the first book in the Bible. And it's, a, it's essentially a framing story for us to kind of have a lens or a framework by which we look at our lives, we look at the world, we understand God, we understand ourselves. But more importantly, we understand Jesus and the redemption story unfolding even in the book of Genesis. And this week we're going to look at a, a character that... The, the, the camera changes focus this week from not Abraham, not Isaac, not Esau, who we talked about last week, but now we find it, it focuses in on this guy, Jacob. And we're going to look at him for the next couple weeks at uh, his story. And I want to read the scripture to you in Genesis 28. If you have a Bible, just leave it open today. It's such an amazing story and such an incredible picture of the way God wants to show up in your life. But to get, before we jump in there, I want to give a little context to, to why Jacob ends up in this place and has this encounter. Uh, we found out last week that Jacob uh, was not an honorable man. He wasn't a good guy. He, he's kind of the anti-hero. He, although, is the, is the protagonist in the story, and, and Genesis kind of puts him out there as the main character for several chapters, it's not an affirmation on who this guy is, on his character. He, he has yet to show any sense of moral high ground or moral aptitude. He hasn't shown any strength of character. In fact, from the moment he was born, we find out Jacob is kind of this conniving, deceiving scoundrel. Uh, it says that his older brother Esau was born moments before him and that Jacob, even at birth, was grasping at his brother's heel. Uh, we, find, we found last week that Jacob did something quite horrible in, in swindling his stupid, although stupid, older brother. He swindled his birthright, uh, trading it for a, a bowl of beans. He, he's a deceiver. He's a controller. And then we find out as we read forward, we don't have time to look at it today, but we find out as we read forward Jacob doesn't just deceive his brother, but he goes even farther and deceives his own father. He, he lies to him, and he, put, he builds this great story so that he can steal the blessing that his father was going to bestow on Esau. He takes it for himself, and so at every step of the way, Jacob is controlling and manipulating, trying to gain blessing and gain favor in his own hands and by his own work, and we see time and time again this guy just doing worse and worse things as it goes along, and so we find Find, Esau finds out that he did this and, and Jacob's dad Isaac realizes that he'd been deceived and tricked and so uh, shame and outrage hits their household and we find Jacob now on the run. Jacob actually has to leave his home because Esau, his older brother, said, I'm going to kill him. And that wasn't an empty threat. He literally vowed, the moment my father dies, I won't do that until my dad dies, but the moment my dad dies, I'm going to kill him. 
And so we see this terrible, terrible situation form because of Jacob's actions. And we find Jacob now on the run, running for his life, literally running for his life because of his own stupid decisions, because of his own mistakes. And so that's the context. He's now on the run, running for his life. And I want to show you this story. It's a beautiful thing. And I think this is going to help somebody who might, maybe you find yourself in a place where you're on the run or maybe you're in transition or maybe you're out in the middle of nowhere and you don't know why. I hope today this word blesses you. But Genesis 28 records this. So Jacob left Beersheba. That was the home of his father and his father's father, Abraham the home that God had established over that family. If you remember a while ago, when we looked at the story of Abraham, God called Abraham out of his father's household to set up in the land that God promised him and showed him in Beersheba. And it says this, he left Beersheba and set out for Haran. Now, if you're paying attention, Haran was the place that God called Abraham out of. This is a picture of backtracking. This is a picture of going entirely the wrong direction. Jacob was supposed to carry the, carry the family along. He was supposed to represent his father, to be a good son, to actually be the, the character and the type of person that God would have wanted him to be, and yet he's going back to the place that God called his father out of in the first place. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible picture of falling away and falling out of grace and falling out of favor with his father and with his household and going back against the will of God over his life. That's the picture here. So he's on the run, and it says in verse 11, and this is so critical, and if you have a Bible open, I want you to highlight this. It says, when he reached a certain place, a certain place, keep that in your mind, circle it, highlight it. We're going to talk about what God does in a certain place. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night, not because he was tired, not because he wanted to, but because he had to, because why? The sun had set. He couldn't go any farther. He would have had he had the opportunity, but now he had to stop in this certain place because the sun had set. And so he takes one of the stones there and he put it under his head and he laid down to sleep on the ground. Picture him. He's on the ground in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness, out in the middle of nowhere, laying on the hard ground with his head on a rock for a pillow. Like this is the first instance that we know of on recorded history of an individual between a rock and a hard place, quite literally. And it says this in verse 12. So here's the story. He's in this certain place and he's laying on the ground and he's just in, this is the lowest point of his whole life. You got to understand that. And it says he has this dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching up to heaven. And the angels of God, messengers of God, representatives of God, that's his understanding of angels, they're messengers and representatives of God, were actually ascending, so going up and descending, they're coming down on the stairway. And there above it stood the Lord at the top of the stairs, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, And here it comes. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and the east, to the north and to the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed because of you, through you and your offspring. I am with you and I will watch over you. Can you say this out loud with me? Wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. And when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And early the next morning, Jacob took a stone, the stone he had placed under his head, and he set it up. He raised it up. Get that picture. As a pillar, and he poured oil on top of it, and he called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Bethel means house of God or gate of heaven. Jacob has this encounter at the moment that he was the farthest from home, farthest from his calling. He was just not in a place where he would have expected to find God there. You ever run run into somebody in a place you didn't expect? It kind of takes you aback, doesn't it? 
Like you, you, you didn't expect to see that person there. Maybe it was someone you know. Maybe it was someone you recognize. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and I went to a steakhouse with some call, ministry colleagues. And I, I was there, and I didn't expect to see this person. I show up, and I, and I sit down at my table, and out from the bathroom, in all of his tanned goodness and chiseled muscles and super bleach blonde hair, was none other than the nature boy, Ric Flair. <laughs> Woo! Remember? No, no, no wrestling fans here? Okay. Yeah, I've got, got a couple honest people that watch that. You know it's fake, right? Anyway, uh, but you, you, it takes you aback, right? You have to kind of process, like, what are you doing here? Maybe, maybe you were somewhere abroad. You were traveling abroad, and you, you ran into a friend or a family member or someone you know somewhere else. There's a moment where you kind of have to triangulate and process, like, why are you here? And this is kind of the picture you get with Jacob in this moment, he has this encounter with God in the last place he ever thought God would show up. And he has this profound moment where he shows up in this, the Bible says, this certain place. And for Jacob, the certain place was anything but certain. I think it's kind of ironic that the translators chose to use that word, that he showed up at a certain place. What they're trying to say is it's a random place. But for Jacob, it was more than random. It represented his destructive decisions. It represented all of his mistakes. It represented how far he'd fallen. This was the place of, of most of his greatest mistakes. It was a, a, the place of shame. It was the dark place. It was an insignificant place. It was the place of disobedience. It was a place of dislocation. It was a place being far from home. It was the uncomfortable place. It was a place of isolation. This was what the certain place was for Jacob. It was the lonely place. It was the place that says, look how far you've fallen. And it was in that certain place that God shows up. If you're writing notes down, I want you to write this down. Um, uh, Jacob would have said this. I didn't expect to find the Lord in this place. But surely he's here. And I just wasn't aware of it. So you got to understand why this was so surprising. And I know, I know that for you, you might not think this way, but maybe you do. But for Jacob, Jacob would have had in his mind that if I'm ever going to experience God, I'm ever going to, you know, you know, get to know God or have a moment like where God would speak to me and let not only bless me, this is going to happen in a holy place in a place where God stuff happens, maybe in a church or a synagogue or, or maybe, maybe at the temple or, or in my father's house where, you know, my father's blessing rests. That's where the God stuff happens. And so Jacob is quite shocked to find out that this God doesn't just show up in, in designated areas, but in fact, he'll show up in desert areas. He'll show up in the destructive place. He'll show up in the place where Jacob least expected it. In Jacob's mind, God was only ever going to be found in certain places, but not the certain place where he was, in, in, in a holy place. But now we find the new definition of the certain place that God shows up in any place. And it confronts this kind of misconception in his mind that if I'm going to ever experience God, it sure, is, it sure isn't going to be here. I think a lot of us carry that misconception. That if I'm ever going to experience God, if I'm ever going to have an encounter with God, it's going to be when I get my life in order and I go back to church. I, I, I'm always blown away by that mindset in so many people who maybe don't come to church. Some of you, maybe you're back to church. This, this, this is the first time in a long time. A lot of people carry this mindset that if I'm going to get right with God, I have to go to church. And there's value in going to church. We preach that all the time. Come to church. You're strengthened. You're empowered. But I'll tell you what, salvation doesn't rest on where you go. In fact, this story is telling us that, that, that salvation follows you where you go. That it actually follows you wherever you go. See, uh, just last week I was, I was at the gym because I'm, I'm such a stud and I work out and stuff, right? And, um, and I, was, I was at the gym and I ran into this guy that I hadn't seen in a while. And I said, hey, man, come back to church. I haven't seen you in a while. Come back to church. And he, and he said, oh, I will, but I got I, I to gotta get back there. I got to, you know, I'm working on myself right now. And, and when I do, I'll, I'll come back. See, in his mind, the, 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 the God, God was, God was over there. God was in that place. God was when I, I get my stuff together. God was when I get back to church. But in Jacob's mind, he has this revelation, this radical revelation that this God is not a God that you have to get to, but he's a God that can show up in any single place. 
This is what David was talking about in Psalm 137. I mean, the guy, like, if you don't know his story, like, this guy had some dark days. And this is why he said, where can I go from your spirit? Like, you were there after I had the affair. You were there after I had my friend murdered. You were there after I lost the child. You were there in all the darkest moments of my life. You were there, like, surprised by the presence of God. And Jacob's having this moment, like, I thought God was only there, but now I found out he's here. That here he is, I show up at this certain place, in the lonely place, in the desolate place, and God is here. This is what the Bible says, Ezekiel 34, look what, these are the words of God. It says, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. Let me confront it, and I feel like I'm preaching to some Christians today. Who, who actually, it's amazing how we'll fall back into that thinking that I got to get back to God. You never got away from him in the first place. And some of you, maybe you're not a believer and you think, I got to find God. Let me tell you something. God's not lost. You are. And so here we see this picture of a God who seeks us out. Look at verse 16, Ezekiel 34, 16. It says, I will seek the lost. I will bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, strengthen the sick. This is the, this is the good news of the gospel. This is what Jesus came to fulfill in its entirety. This is why he said, I came to seek and save that which, was, which are lost, those who are lost. I came to seek and save lost people. We often think, as Jacob does, that I can't expect to find God here, but I, I, came, I came with some good news today. There is no place that God cannot and will not show up. I had a, an amazing conversation with a lady last week as she was leaving um, leaving our service, and I was just asking, how you doing? She immediately started to tear up and said, it's hard. It's been a hard season. Uh, she lost her husband not too long ago and still trying to figure out how to live life now with her better half gone on to heaven. Do I sell the house? Do I keep it? I don't want to let it go, but I want to move on. I don't know what to do. And just she started to cry immediately, and I could just feel her pain. But then the she said something, and it just arrested me. It wasn't even what she said. It was her face when she said it. She said, but you know what? Tears in her eyes. And she looked up, because I was like a foot and a half taller than her. And she looked up. She said, but God has been with me. Like, I didn't expect to find God here. I didn't expect that God would show up in my grief. I didn't expect that God could show up in my addiction. I didn't expect that God could show up in my betrayal. I didn't expect that God could show up in my dysfunction. I didn't expect that God could show up after my divorce. I didn't expect that God could show up in this or that. Let me just tell you today, there is no place in your life in this world that you can go that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords cannot show up. I didn't expect to find him, but surely here, here he is. God is here. See, we serve a God of appointment, a God who wants to show up, and he's always on time. Jacob just couldn't believe it. It wasn't just, though, that he was flabbergasted and blown away. It said, like it says in the text, it says he was afraid, and the translation doesn't mean like fearful, like he was scared. It was like he was rattled, like just shook, and, and, and he exclaimed, surely God is here. He has just this profound moment, but it wasn't just like, like where he was as far as geography that was blowing his mind. It was also like, like how God came. You see, in his mind, it wasn't just that God was a place I had to get to, but I also had to get up. Like there was this level of God is high and lifted up, and that's entirely true. That God is, God is in heaven, and, and I am here. And that God is glorious and high and lifted up, and I am down here. And so if I'm ever going to experience heavenly things, if I'm ever going to obtain glory, if I'm ever going to connect to God, it's going to be because I somehow ascend. And yet he has this dream, and it blows his mind. If you're writing notes, write this down. I think Jacob would tell us today, I didn't expect to find the Lord in this way. Not just in this place, but in this way. But surely he is here, and I was not aware of it. Let's look back at verse 11 
and 12, it says, taking one of the stones, he put it under his head and he laid down to sleep. And he said he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching heaven. And the angels of God, messengers of God, were ascending and descending. What is that a picture of? Well, in Jacob's mind, this is the first time it would have ever occurred to him that, that God is not the, the, the one that, or sorry, I'm not the one that has to get to God. God is the one who has made a way to me. That there's this mechanism, this, this staircase, another translation calls it a ladder, or that, that, that there's this thing that God has built or established from heaven that touches earth, that actually gives earth and heaven access to commune with one another. That it actually gives us access to, to, to heaven. And this is just a profound revelation for him. It says, in Jacob's mind, heaven was something he had to get to. And now he finds out, no, heaven's got to me. That God dropped this staircase, this, this way for me to encounter him, to, to receive from him. That God has done that. Jacob sees this open door, a stairway, a way with lots of room on it. I love that picture that it says there wasn't just one angel going up and down. There were angels, messengers of God going up and down. I, I envision a staircase with lots of room, uh, width-wise. That they're going up and down, freely going up and down, into the presence of God and back to earth and into the presence of God and back to earth. This is a picture of the gospel of Jesus. That stairway is a cross. That's what this is. It's, it's the way that God has prepared for us to actually get to God. That's what the gospel is. That's what, that's what John was talking about in John 1. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And behold, we have, behold, he put on flesh and dwelt among us. What's that mean? It means that God came down, that God, it was God that put the staircase there. It was God telling Jacob, I have made a way for you and me to know one another. I have made a way for me to get to you. You don't have to get up to me. You see, a lot of us, we think that it's our job to ascend. And we, you know, in Genesis 9, we looked at that not too long ago, the Tower of Babel. It said, let us get to heaven. Let us build a tower that we can reach the heavens. Well, most of us don't build towers and put our name on it, unless well, some people do, but <laughs> most of us, most of us, we build different types of towers. We stack morality or good deeds, or we stack success or relationships, or, or we try, or, or career, or what have you. We try to, we try to put, pile these things up, so to speak, so that we can get to that glory that we know we're made for. And now here Jacob has this picture, this revelation that heaven is not a place that I have to get to, but in fact, heaven has already come to me. And it's amazing that the, 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 the staircase touches the earth, like where he's at. Again, he would have thought, okay, well, maybe if there was ever like a door to heaven, it would be in a holy place. But he finds it's actually out in this desert place where this door opens up and God descends. And we start to see this connectivity, this bridge built. And that is what the gospel is. Don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. The gospel is this, that God so loved the world that he, he gave, he sent his son to Prepare and make a way for us to be able to obtain eternal life. That's the gospel. Look, at John, look what Jesus said in John chapter 3. He said, no one has ascended to heaven except the one who has descended from heaven. The son of man, talking about himself. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, the son of man must be lifted up. What was he referring to? Thanks, Pastor Dan. The cross. Yeah, he was referring to being lifted up on the cross. That's... The bridge, the way that was being made, then, then here's the promise that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. This is what Jesus is talking about. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus is that staircase. And so, so if the first thing we we're talking about was about an appointment that God will show up wherever you want, it's not just that God will show up, but God has opened a door and you have access to the things of God. Not because you showed up in the right place, not because you did the right things, but because God, who is rich in mercy, opened a door and made a way and descended upon you and I and said, come and be with me and come and live with me and experience the glory and life and goodness that I have for you. That's the gospel. It's a beautiful picture. Some of you need to hear this today. And I think I've been, I've been challenged by this this week that, okay, so through Jesus... I always have heavenly access. I think sometimes we think we close the door, don't we? 
well, I had a bad week, and I guess I closed that door. Jesus said, I am the one who holds the keys, and I open doors that no man can close. So that means no matter what you did this week, no matter how far you've fallen, you might be out in a certain place too. I'm talking to a Christian right now. You did not and cannot ever shut that door. That door is open in Jesus' name, and you have access to all the things of the kingdom. You didn't open it in the first place. He didn't expect to find the Lord in this place or in this way. If you're writing notes, write this down. Number three, I didn't expect to find the Lord in this state. This is where the rubber meets the road for me. But surely he is here and I was not aware of it. Look back at verse 13. It says, there above the staircase stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham. Now, I almost can picture Jacob at this point in his dream. Like, he doesn't know what's going to happen. He didn't expect to find God here. He didn't expect to, to find, like, that, that we're going to have a dialogue with the living God. I, I'm kind of envisioning him almost starting to coil back right now. Like, okay, God's about to speak to me. He knows and I know that I shouldn't be here right now. He knows and I know I made a big mess. He knows and I know how big of a jerk I've been and that I haven't, I've been deceiving and manipulating from day one. Here it comes. Like I picture that almost like, almost like this. I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham. Yeah, I know, I'm Abraham. Yeah, Grampy, yep, yep. And the God of Isaac. Yeah, I know, my dad's way better than me too. Falling short of him as well. And it's almost like I'm picturing him just starting to recoil all the more, like there's Abraham and Isaac, and now he's going to start speaking to, to me, and this is going to be bad, this is going to be bad. And he says, I will give you and your descendants, oh, here we go, he's not just going to punish me, he's going to punish my kids and my kids' kids too. Oh, man. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and the east and the north. Hey, you know what? Why not the south too? The south too. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. What he's saying there is, I'm going to bless you so profoundly that people around you will be blessed just by the fall off of your blessing. And so at that moment, Jacob's got to be like, say what? Wait, what? I, I was expecting you to tell me all the bad things that I already know I did. I was expecting to have a, a, a curt conversation about the things that, all the ways that I've fallen short and all the ways that I've screwed up. And yet God just comes in and bypasses all of that and starts speaking blessing over his life. Look at this, verse 15, bring it back up. He says, I am with you, Jacob. Just like I was with your father and your grandfather, I'm with you. He says, you're mine. And I'm with you wherever you go, and I'll bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I promised you. And Jacob, at his, this is so beautiful. At the moment where in his mind he was least blessable, where he was the least deserving, of not just an encounter with God, but the blessing of God, the moment where he was at his absolute worst, God shows up and speaks blessing over his life. That's who God is, church. See, God always wants to give you what he desires for you, not what you deserve. And what he desires for you is good. And it's based on his goodness. I think a lot of us, we... We approach God the, the way that, that I, was in pic, I was picturing Jacob. I, I see some of you who, who come to church, you come to church almost like this. You like, you kind of edge your way in. Because we have this mindset about who God is, that God's going to come in and he's going he's gonna to rub my nose and my mistakes and I'm going to have to confess my sins and I'm going to have to, and confession's good, but we have this kind of faulty mindset about who God is and the God of Jacob and the God of Isaac and the God of Abraham and the God of King's church. And I have found this about God. 
That he loves to come in in the place where you lie. I love that. In the place where you lie, says to Jacob. Right in the mess that you made. Right in that place where you're least deserving. He loves to come in and speak blessing and life over you. That's what God does. God is not a terror down. God is a builder upper. I don't even care if that's grammar correct. God builds up. He is a restorer. He is, he is a giver. That's who he is. I think a lot of the time we have this mindset of who God is, that he's going to come in, he's going to smash us down. That's, I think, what Jacob was expecting at that moment. But in the very moment where he felt like, I am, this is the least blessable I have ever been in my life, he encounters God's goodness and blessing. It's in that place, that certain place, that space where he thought, Here it comes. I'm going to get what I deserve. You see, that's what grace is. One definition of grace is unmerited favor. Jacob was receiving unmerited favor. He didn't deserve that. He deserved a kick in the butt. And yet here comes God bypassing that and blessing him. I found this to be true about God. For the last like five or six years, I have found the value of the prophetic in my life. And what the prophetic is, some of you might get freaked out by that. All all the prophetic is is that God likes to speak through his people. And so I have surrounded myself very closely. My three kind of three of the people that I let speak into my life more than anybody uh, all have this kind of prophetic gifting and I'm with them weekly. And I remember when I first started just having these times with them, my wife trying to wrap her head around like, why would you go and hang out with Kirk or Anthony or Pastor Dan, when they're just going to read your mail? Why would you go and, and have dialogue with them and pray with them when God's just going to tell them, like, how sketchy you really are? <laughs> and I've found that God isn't interested in rubbing your nose in your sketchiness. He wants to speak to the secret places of your heart. So it says in 1 Corinthians 14. It says the spirit of prophecy speaks to the secret places of your heart and, and brings life where there was no life. You see, who you aren't and what you've done is no secret. I think we all think that, that, that we're going to have to talk about the, secret, the things we're trying to keep secret. That's not what God's interested in. He's not trying to expose you and shame you. He's trying to speak to the secret longings of your heart. You see, this is what's so incredible about this story. It's my favorite part. It says when he reached a certain place, the sun set, and so he had to stop. And for the first time in his life, Jacob just stopped. And you think about his whole life, this guy had been trying to manipulate and control and obtain a blessing on his life. That's all he ever wanted. And in so doing, he just made a bigger and bigger mess of things. You ever, anybody ever feel like you're doing that? Like, I'm trying to fix things, I'm trying to help things, and I'm just screwing it up more and more. And the first time in his life, for the first time, I think he just resigned. I think he plunked down on the, on the ground, on the hard ground, and just said, all right, I can go no farther. And it's at that moment that God shows up and blesses him and gives him the thing that he wanted in the first place. Isn't that amazing? Think about it. Like from the, from the moment we saw Jacob, he's trying to, trying to get this. He's trying to obtain it. And here's the thing he realizes. Grace, the grace and favor of God is not something you get. It's something God gives. It's not something you obtain. It's something you receive by faith. And it's the gift of God. God wants to grace your life. And God wants to speak to and bless the secret places and secret longings in your heart that go deeper than the secrets you're trying to keep. He's actually trying to meet you at your place of need. He's trying to meet you at your most profound cravings and urges. He's trying to satisfy that. And Jacob realizes that's who God is. That I can't believe, if you're writing notes, write this down, that God God would meet me in this state. This is about acceptance. That God has accepted him called him his own and blessed him. God comes out of nowhere and pours out grace, unlimited favor on his life. Uh, Ephesians 2, let's read this together. It says, for it's by grace you have been saved through really hard work. No, through taking things into your own hands. 
No, through going to church. No, through hanging out with Christians. It's by grace you've been saved through that. No. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. It's that yielding. Saying, God, I, I can't do this on my own. I just, I want what you have for me. It's receiving. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. So no one can boast. You see, Jacob didn't get up that day and say, how awesome am I? He realized he didn't deserve it. And let me tell you something, when grace hits you, when you have an encounter with the living God and God speaks something over your life and speaks something into your heart, you you cannot leave that going, wow, I really, I really deserve that. I am some awesome. You leave that exchange saying, God, you are so good to me. You're, you're better to me than I deserve. See, Jacob has this revelation of grace. In his place of rejection, he finds himself chosen. In his place of humiliation, he finds himself vindicated and, and elected and selected and accepted. Isn't that amazing? In the place where he was most, most rejected and most by alone, he finds the God of the universe showing up and saying, you're mine. In his place of dislocation, he finds himself reconciled. See, God's blessing is something he wants to give you. And God will always reveal and release what he desires for you, not what you deserve. If I can just confront, and I want to even speak to, this might weird you out a little bit. I want to speak to the, to, to the, the powers. There's spirits that try to convince you of things. And there is a lie from the pit that says that your exchange with God is based on what you do and do not do. It is not. That God is not the God who gives you what you deserve. He gives you what you do not deserve. He reveals the secrets of your heart. One more observation and then I'm gonna, we're going to be done. I love this. Verse 16, let's read it. It says, when he awoke up from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't aware of it. He was here all along. And I just, I wasn't aware of it. And then he has this encounter. And he says, it says this, that he was afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. It's the gate of heaven. And early the next morning, it says, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head. Get that picture. The place of his shame, the place of his loss, the place of his isolation, the stone, the hard place. He took that that stone that was under his head and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it. Oil is a picture of consecration and anointing. And he called that place Bethel, which means the house of God. This is such a picture. And if you're taking notes, write this down. Some of, you, some of you are OCD and you want all four notes. So write this down. I didn't expect to find the Lord in this thing. But surely he was here and I was not aware. I think this is so cool. Like, Jacob has this encounter with God. And he finds that the grace of God begins to restore and rebuild him right at ground zero. It's not that God like picked him up and transported him to some holy place or some better state, but it was in fact at the very place of his mess, he, he takes the, the stone. Think about that, that stumbling block, that, that, that stone that he was laying on, he takes it and that thing that was a pillow, that thing that he was sleeping on, that thing that was just, it represented all the nasty in his life. He, he raises it up and it becomes a pillar. And he anoints it with oil. And now the very thing that was his shame is now shouting the glory of God over his life. God's grace is so all-encompassing that he doesn't just cover your sins so that, like, let's let's not talk about it anymore. It's not... The Bible says that he remembers your sin no more. That means he's not gonna... He's not gonna rub your face in your mess. But what he does do is he takes that space and that certain place and he will actually flip it up and anoint it and it will become that 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 test will become a testimony that pillow becomes a platform that says how great is God that's
That's what God does. God takes you from the mess and he actually gives you a message. Isn't that amazing? And I've seen it in my own life. God showing up in unexpected places. I, things that were to my shame are now I give God glory for. I, I think about the fact, some people ask me, when, were you, when, when did you know you were going to become a pastor? I, I, they'll say, when did you get called into ministry? I say, I'm still waiting for the call. I, I just got called to Jesus and started just saying yes and walking through doors and here I am today. But it all, my, my first, the first time I really felt God speak to me, I, I was at like a drunken, drug-induced party on UMB Fredericton campus in 2001. Standing in this room thinking this is far from my father's house, far from the standard I know I was taught, far from the grace of God in my mind, like talk about falling from grace. Here I am in a place that I knew better. And I'd been frequenting more and more. I'm standing in the middle of this room and just had this moment with God where I heard the voice of God speak to me saying, son, I have better for you. I didn't feel ashamed. I didn't feel humiliated. I felt blessed. I felt called. And from that moment, that, that place where I was lying in my mess, God picked me up. And now I can testify to the, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I was at a party because it's the, it's the grace of God on my life. And I say, look, God found me at my lowest. He found me in the darkest place. And now the glory of God shines out of that darkness. He did it for me. He did it for the Apostle Paul. Think about it. Like Apostle Paul, he was the the biggest opponent to the gospel. And he meets God on the way somewhere and he turns him upside down. And now the biggest opponent becomes the biggest proponent for the kingdom of God. The, the opposition becomes the apostle. That's what God does. He flips it upside down and anoints it, gives it a message. I think I was thinking about Pastor Adam Brewer today. Like here's a guy who struggled with addiction his whole life. And now God shows up in his life in a powerful way, in, in such profound power that he doesn't have to run away from it and say, yeah, let's not talk about that. That's his testimony now. And he's leading hundreds of people in freedom from addiction by the grace of Jesus, saying, if God can free me, he can free you. So here's the good news for you today. I don't know what your certain place is. Maybe, maybe it's a sinful place. Maybe it's a place where you've just been making dumb choices. Uh, maybe it's just a place of isolation. Maybe you're in a, in a desert place. Maybe you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death and you're like that lady I was talking about, just dealing with grief. Here's the simple message. I just felt like God told me to come and tell you today. There isn't one certain place in your life that I won't show up. I'll show up in the loss. I'll show up after the divorce. Nothing disqualifies you. You didn't qualify yourself in the first place. I'll show up in, after the affair. I'll show up in your job search. I'll show up in your isolation, your dissatisfaction. I'll show up in your gambling addiction. I'll show, that, I'll show up in your porn addiction. I'll show up in the struggle. That's who our God is. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and you, and me. I want to invite you to stand with me. I'm going to pray for us. And I just felt like the Lord wanted to show himself to some people this weekend. And that if we can learn anything from the story of Jacob, it's this, that this is the day of encounter. That this is the day of grace. That this is the place of encounter. That today is the day that I receive my blessing. That you cannot outrun the grace of God. You cannot outrun it. You cannot get away from it. And so the simple job for us is to just stop and yield. Say, God, I want what you have for me. 
I'm done manipulating. I'm done controlling my circumstances. I'm done being a deceiver, a conniver. Uh, I'm, I'm done with that. I just want to receive what you have for me. Would you speak to the secret places in my heart? And would you bring life where there was no life? Would you turn those rocks I'm sleeping on? Would you flip them up? And would you make them a great testimony of your grace and goodness over my life? And so I just wanted to pray for you today that God would interrupt you and that on a day that you thought we're going to go to church and we're going to celebrate Father's Day and I, and I hope that you do but I hope you don't leave without receiving from God right now just a, a word and I think he's going to do that as we sing even as we respond that, that if you'll open yourself up like, and you just have that moment I believe that God will speak something into the secret places of your heart that only he can say I could never say it and so if you want to receive today and you'd say you know what I'm in a certain place I'm in that place and it's got a name. You know, it might not be Luz. Maybe it's something else that you're in. But God wants to change the name of that place to the house of God. God wants to change the name of your life to the house of God. So if you want to receive, just, to, just open your hands. Let's pray together. Father, thank you today that there's no place we can go from your grace. There's no place we can't outrun it. We can't out sin it. Lord, we can only yield to it. So Father, I pray for every single person today who's in the certain place. I pray for the one who's in the desert place right now, Lord. I pray that you would interrupt them and let them know that you're with them, that their testimony today would be, yeah, even though I lost my husband, even though I miss him dearly, I have found a God who is good, who is bringing me through the valley of the shadow of death, so I'll fear no evil. Father, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, right now, just come. Encourage the lonely heart right now, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for the one right now that they're in the place where they have made a mess of things, like Jacob. They've, they, they have made their bed, and now they have to lie in it. Father, right now, by your grace, Holy Spirit, I just believe there's some people here right now that you've got some sin issues, and the Spirit of God wants to meet you right now at ground zero in the place that you lie and begin to rebuild you. Say, you're forgiven. I want to speak to the, to the secret places in your life. And I want, to, I want to flip that stone up and make it a pillar of my grace and goodness. Right now I'm praying for the one who, they're in this transition place and they're wondering when I'm going to arrive and get there. I just want to speak to you right now and just hear the, hear the word of the Lord over your life that says, I am with you. And when I am with you, you are where you need to be. That heaven and grace and glory is not something you need to get to. It's, it's, it's in Jesus. And so as you have Jesus, just receive new grace today, new mercy. Father, thank you today. There's no place we can run from your presence. Lord, I thank you. This isn't a somber thing. This is an excited thing. Jacob was excited when he realized, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was unaware. How awesome is this? So, Father, right now, even at the sound of my voice, Holy Spirit, would you just start to encourage hearts? Fill us up, Lord. Would we leave this place realizing that you are with us wherever we go and that you have been with us at every single moment, and that today is a new day and I can go in the grace and goodness of God, that you have called us your own, that you have approved us, you've accepted us, you're rebuilding us, you're restoring us, and you're calling us to great blessing. And so, Father, would that be our expectation today? We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Father, let us be aware of your presence. Let us not go one place this week where we are not aware of your presence. At the workplace, let us not have to be surprised. Let us be expectant of your presence. Lord, in our families, in our marriages, in the struggle, Lord, we'll be aware of your presence. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Give God some praise today. Thank him for his presence. Thank you, Lord.